Our New Testament lesson comes today from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. Please listen now for the voice and the Spirit of God. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. May God bless the reading of the word. You know, 30 years ago, when I first came out of seminary, I could not have preached this sermon. I'm basing the sermon on two texts that I believe are related to each other. The first from Exodus 3, verses 1 through 14, the story of when God calls Moses to go and liberate the Hebrew slaves from the land of Egypt. And as we know the story, Moses pushes back, tries to wiggle out of the responsibility, and then he asks God, well, if I were to do this, then tell me who it is who is sending me for this task. And then God answers in these words that we have had many, many sermons on, I am who I am, or another translation, I am becoming who I am becoming. You know, if a psychologist was looking at this and maybe analyzing it, he or she might say that we have a God who is very comfortable in his or her own skin. I am who I am. It sort of says nothing and everything all at the same time. And I think this text is also directly related to the text in John 4. The story of the woman at the well who meets Jesus, and Jesus asks her to give him a drink. And she says, how is it that you, a Jew, is asking me, a Samaritan woman, to give you a drink? And then he says, if you actually knew who I was, you'd be asking for more than just water. You'd be asking for living water. And she obviously shows interest in this and wants that, that living water. And then Jesus does, and what almost appears to be kind of a trick question says, well, then go and get your husband and come back here to me. And she says to Jesus, well, actually, I have no husband. And it's this particular moment that seems to have such depth and divine presence to it. I can imagine what she may have felt in that moment because there was all kinds of possibility for shame, for embarrassment. She also might have tried to wiggle out of what she needed to say, like Moses tried to do. And instead, she's able to come back to Jesus and say, well, actually, I have no husband. 
And we have to read between the lines here maybe a little bit, but I'm kind of wondering what Jesus may have felt at that moment. And I'm wondering if he may have had a little bit of a smile on his face as she responded to him and said, yeah, I've got a woman here who seems very comfortable in her own skin. Instead of responding out of shame or embarrassment, she tells him the truth. I have no husband. And at a deeper level, I think what we have here, it's Jesus' way of saying to her and the writer's way of saying to us, you know, I know you. I know your story. I know you down to the very depths of your soul and I still accept you just as you are. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am. I have to tell you that those are very profound words for me. After a pretty difficult childhood, I spent the first 15 years of my adulthood trying to be anything but just as I am. I tried to become an Olympian. I went to college and I graduated with a double major and double honors. And I was trying to base my life not on just who I was or just as I am, but just who I wanted to be. You see, I spent the first 15 years of my life trying to craft a story and an image for myself. I was going to be Brian the Olympian. I was going to be Brian the academic. I was going to be Brian this extra special person. And that worked for me for a number of years. And finally, in 1997, that narrative came crashing down around me. And I spent three years in some pretty intensive weekly spiritual direction and therapy. And essentially what those three years were about was simply learning to accept my life just as it was. You see, what I had to learn to do was to accept my own story, my own background. And I had spent over 15 years really running from my story. You see, like the woman who'd been married five times, I had to learn to accept that I was actually a child of a teenage mother. I had to learn to accept that I was that child who was abandoned at age three by that same mother. I had to learn to accept that I'm a child with two parents who between them have had 11 marriages. And all of that kind of put together means that I had to learn to accept that I grew up with some pretty severe emotional deficits. And for a lot of years, I was able to cover them by outstanding bicycle racing and by good academics and good grades. And eventually, it came crashing down. But here's the amazing thing that came out of that. One of the things that I realized in that process of spiritual direction and therapy is that in many ways I had had a 20 or 30 year long internship dealing with loss and transition. In many ways, by the age of 25, I already had a PhD or two in loss and transition, all of the change that I had experienced in my life. And when I learned to accept myself just as I was, when I learned to accept my own story and my own background, the world opened up for me again. And for the next 23 years and to this day, all of the work that I have done has been dealing either with people or organizations who are experiencing loss, transition, or transformation. Working with juveniles and probation and foster care coming out of the Oregon Youth Authority, working with families in hospice, 
during, doing interim work in churches and eventually in this position in the Presbytery, in a Presbytery that's also experienced loss over recent years and an amazing time of transition in this Presbytery and in our churches and our culture. I ran for at least 17 years, and when I learned to accept and live out of my own story, God opened up a whole new avenue for me in my life. Just as I am, though tossed about, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. A few months ago, I read a quote from author and public speaker Brene Brown. And that quote has really stuck, stuck with me. She said, I now see how owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing we will ever do. I now see how owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing we will ever do. And one of the things that I have learned over the past 20 years of my own life and transformation and work is that it's really not about getting people and organizations to a place of acceptance. It's really more about honoring the process of getting to acceptance. One of the early things that I learned when I was doing hospice work were the five stages of grief that I'm sure many of you also know. The denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and then finally, acceptance. And one of the things I discovered both in my hospice work as well as other work in organizations is that it's not really my role to get a person to that final stage of acceptance. Really, my role is simply to create the environment, create the environment and the safe place for God then to do the work, for God to heal, for God to change, for God to transform. And what I learned in that is it wasn't so much about telling people where they should go or wanted to go, it was more about just simply helping them honor what was real in that particular moment. And if they were in denial or in anger or bargaining, to just help them to articulate that and to voice that. And there was this amazing thing. I didn't have to push them at all. It seemed like God would take that. As long as they were honest with themselves, God had this way of sort of nudging them into the next stage. It's what I learned about my own life. Once you're real about your own story, your own feelings, your own struggles, your own life, God has a way of transforming that. Again, it goes back to the scripture text and to the song. It's about learning to accept ourselves just as we are, just as I am. And really the biggest lesson over the last two decades of this work has been this we don't really make people grow. We don't really solve anything ourselves. All we really do is to set the stage for God to do the work of healing and transformation. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. 
You know, I don't think I have to do too much work to get all of us to admit that this time that we are in is just really, really tough. You know, in other meetings that I'm having with other ministers and colleagues and around the presbytery, I know that people are struggling. This is a hard time. I'm struggling. Every day I have to work to stay hopeful, to stay positive, to do the work that is before us. With the coronavirus, we're missing some of the things that we have depended on for most of our lives, the things that we enjoy in church, the passing of the peace, those kind hugs that we share with each other, singing together, sharing the bread and the cup around an actual table, being able to look into each other's eyes. You know, we already knew this, but we really have, we've really learned that we are meant to touch and hold each other. And it's one of the things I know most of us are yearning for deeply in this time. And then if that wasn't enough, we have become more and more aware in this past year of the structural bias and racism that is in our culture and, and in our churches even. One of the things that I am absolutely struck by is, is, is the information now that this Oregon territory was actually set up as a white utopia and that language is actually in the charter for this. It's sobering to discover how much work we have to do. And then on top of that, we've been dealing with cultural and political crises all at the same time. It's a lot, and some days I wonder if it's more than we can handle. But so far, so good, one day at a time. But one of the things, again, that I've learned through my own work and transformation in my life is that the way we get through this is not trying to craft something we actually want, not to pretend it is something that it actually isn't, but to get to that hard place of accepting this is life as it is right now. This is what we are experiencing. How we are and who we are is the reality that we have to contend with at this moment. And I think that's the thing that I have learned and discovered. There's something transformative, there's something, something liberating, not about pretending to get into something else or be something else, but to actually acknowledge and accept the reality that we have at this moment. And I think that's the beauty of this story in John. You know, if you've even been married for five times, or like me, if you're the child of a teenage mother, with parents who've been married 11 times, or if you're anything other than the picture-perfect person that you want to be and think you should be, let God see the real you. If life is anything but the perfect picture of what you would like it to be, my encouragement to you and what I've learned over life is to let God see the real, let God see the raw. Let God even see the ugly reality of it. This is a hard time. And I don't think we do ourselves any favor, favors to gloss over it. And so in this time, if you are suffering or if you're, if you're angry or if you're resentful or even if you're hopeless, I would encourage you not to try to run from it like I did for 15 years. I would encourage you to let God work with the real stuff, work with the real you. Remember from the story between Moses and God that we have a God who's pretty darn comfortable in God's own skin. And I think that's what God asks of us as well. When Jesus came to the woman at the well, he discovered a woman who was comfortable in her own skin as she gave him the real story. Remember, God already knows our real story. We just have to be willing to 
admit it and share it with God. Just as I am thy love unknown has broken every barrier down now to be thine yea thine alone O Lamb of God we come we God continue to bless us on this amazing journey. Amen.